going on, an event that only happens once every five years in general election. Oh dear. <laughs> like that, isn't it? Yeah. So I thought this morning I would examine very deeply the doctrine of election. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but um, who's had enough of it? Not the doctrine of election. I won't go into that, that's a mind deal. Okay. But you know, all the hype, all the press conferences, people who've been polished by spin doctors to make them look good and they still don't look that good. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But in the last few months, all the run up to last Thursday, we've had them all up way, all the politicians have been there clamouring for our attention, you know, falling over each other, trying to win our affection, trying to win our vote it's been so important to them, you know. My neighbour over the road, a well-known canvasser of a, what can I say, a local nationalist party. <laughs> not mention any parties this morning, no names will be mentioned, okay? But um, he came over, I trust we can rely on your vote, <laughs> despite my house being plastered in posters indicating an alternative choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, He's, um, he's just about starting to talk to me again now. <laughs> I wasn't rude to him, honest. But uh, anyway, usually the politicians, and I'm generalising, please, and I know there must be some that, that are different, but um, they don't seem to care that much, do they, most of the time? The general public seems to be written over roughshod and, and um, excitement as an election moving. Things are different then, you know. They've been sitting pretty, they've got a nice job, they've got two houses, they've even got a house on the little island for the ducks. You see that island? Yeah. They've got everything. But in the last few months they've been vulnerable. Please, please look for me. They've been so vulnerable, you almost feel sorry for them, don't you? you know, they've been so vulnerable that they because suddenly, after that time, there's a time of uncertainty. They don't know what's gonna happen. You know, the possibility is they might not have a job after Thursday, last Thursday. And some of them haven't. Some of them have joined the doll queue now, I suppose. But um, five years ago, the outgoing Prime Minister wouldn't even move out of number 10. <laughs> he didn't want to go. Please don't kick me out like it here. <laughs> but he had to go, almost physically removed. <laughs> No wonder then, in the run-up to the election, all the political parties made, you know, promises. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll do this then. You know, they're trying to outdo each other. They're all making these promises. We'll cut this. We'll cut that. We'll cut unemployment. We'll give more money to the NHS. We'll, we'll lower taxes. We'll, we'll tax the rich people even more. You know, and it's like... Well, it's, it's a bit of a minefield, really, isn't it? You just don't know what to think. The only thing I thought was, blah, blah, blah. I've heard it all before. I'm sorry. <laughs> the trouble is, most politicians don't honour their promises, do they? Once they're back in power, the pre-election promises seem a million miles away. Did I really say that? Did I really promise you that? Oh, I didn't mean that. And the feeling is, well, perhaps you can't really trust them. So what parties did you vote for? Don't answer, okay? I said I don't want to hear any names of any parties this morning, right? Don't answer, but I reckon there's a huge difference of opinion in here. You know? From the right to the left. <laughs> you know, don't go that way. You know, what's the point of me when it's a left boy? <laughs> Here's the thing, right? And this is nothing to do with what I'm preaching on. We all believe in God, don't we, for, for our inspiration, for our direction, to, to guide us, to lead us, to help us make our decisions. So why do we all vote for different parties? I'll leave you with that one. Because <laughs> surely God would, have, God would have had a particular party and a particular person and we would have all been led to vote for them, but I don't know. <laughs> You'd be thinking about that. But I hate politics. I hate all the angling for the votes, the facades, the fakeness, the spin, the fake smiles, the kissing the babies and all that, <coughs> you know, that they do. The empty promises that it's based on is, is the thing that I hate the most. But that got me thinking about promises. 
We know politicians can't be trusted, but we even know our own promises sometimes can't be 100% trusted. Because we've fallen, aren't we? Saved by grace. <laughs> But we also know somebody whose promises have stood, have stood the test of time and can be relied on 100%. You know what I remember? I remember some, nearly 20 years ago now, we, we, were, we were embarking on an exciting time of our lives when we were going to move a very, very long way to the other side of the planet. And you know what? When God leads you to do things like that, you don't have all the facts and figures. You don't have everything. You don't have the full plan. There's some empty spaces and I'm thinking, my goodness, how is this going to work? What are we going to live on? Where are we going to live? What's going to happen? How are we going to get, you know, all these things are there, aren't they? And you know what, I opened my Bible one day and it's like God's written things in there 2,000, 3,000 years ago. In some places, right? Over 3,000 years ago. And it's as if he's just put it there for you now. And I opened up things in the Psalms. I haven't got it here this morning. But it said something like, even if I take the wings of the morning and go and settle on the uttermost parts of the earth, yeah. I will be there. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's a fantastic promise, isn't it? And you know, yeah. we've got so much in here. We've got so many. And I thought, you know, this morning, let's look at some, some, of the, some of God's promises. Forget all those promises you've heard. Whether or not they come to pass in the next five years, we don't know. But let's think about God's promises this morning. And the, and the passage I've got in question is Psalm 91. And it says, it says this, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress in my God. In Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste by noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right side, but none, it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and, the and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample at the foot. <coughs> because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me. And I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That's a great psalm, isn't it? You know, and, and one that we've probably all taken comfort from over the years. Uh, yet this is the same psalm that the devil knew and quoted to Jesus when Jesus would be tempted in the wilderness, wasn't it? And it's a shame sometimes, isn't it, that the devil knows the Bible perhaps better than we do sometimes. But anyway, let's look into this great psalm and see the message that God's got for us today. The first thing we notice about this psalm is that the promises within it seem to be only available to certain people. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Have you noticed that throughout the Bible? Conditional, conditional promises versus unconditional promises. As with many passages and verses in the Bible, you can't claim the promises until you meet the requirements for some of them. There are unconditional and conditional promises found in the Bible. Most promises that begin with the word if are conditional. Yeah, there's a condition applied to that. God promises to do something if we do something. But you may look, even John 3.16, look at this. For God so loved the world. And that's unconditional, isn't it? God so loved the world. He loved the world no matter what. That he gave his only son no matter what. Unconditional. And then it says that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. There's the condition. If you believe in him, then you'll have everlasting life. 
Then there's the often quoted verse in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, so you know what kind of promise that one is, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So there's a series of conditions, yeah? You've got to humble yourself. Yeah, well, you've got to be called by his name, then you've got to humble yourself, you've got to pray, seek his face, and turn from your wicked ways. If you do those things, then what's he going to do? He's going to hear from heaven and heal, heal the land. And, you know, all those things are going to happen, aren't they? But we've got our bit to do. I've said it so many times, God partners with us, you know. If we do this, he does that. Yeah. There's some passages that are also limited to people who live a certain way. Romans chapter 8 is one such passage. If you live according to Romans 8, 1, yeah? There is now no conde condemnation, sounds great that, doesn't it? To those who are in Christ Jesus. You have to be in Christ Jesus to have no condemnation. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who don't walk according to the flesh, according to the Spirit. So... It only applies to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, our text, Psalm 91, this morning is another. If you live according to Psalm 91, then the promises in that psalm are yours. And there's quite a few in there we're going to see. So notice the requirements of Psalm 91 in verse 1. He that dwells, he that dwells, not has a fleeting visit, not passes by, you know, but he who dwells, he who lives in, in that. Dwells means abides, doesn't it? It means lives in, abides. You know, and John 15, 4. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So to, to dwell or abide means to live in, to be connected to in a permanent way. And that's how our relationship with Jesus is meant to be, the vine. Yeah? Jesus is the, you know... Jesus is a vine with with the branches, and the ground which we're loose, rooted in is God, and the Holy Spirit works through all that to produce fruit in us, just like a tree, just like a grapevine. If you've ever seen one growing in the secret place, not near towards or previously resided that secret place. You know, many people dwell in the world, in the sinful world, but are you in the secret place with God? The secret place refers to the holy of holies back in the temple. Symbolically, that's the place where the people dwell, with, 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 you know, where God dwelt with his people. And only the high priest could enter it because it was such a holy place. And even then he had to have a rope around his leg in case he had to be dragged out. But today, there is no temple with the Holy of Holies like that. Since Jesus paid that ultimate price, yeah, the veil was torn in two, wasn't it, from the top to the bottom. Not only did that happen physically in the temple, right, as a, as a sign to us, but it was also happened uh, symbolically to show the separation between us and God has now been removed. Yeah? There's now nothing to separate us from God because Jesus has paid the price and ripped that veil in two. But we need to remain connected to him and in him. So whatever we go through, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how tough things are sometimes, no one can take away our connection to God mm -hmm. through Jesus. You know, that exists in our hearts, and that's that secret place in our hearts, isn't it? The place that we can go, wherever, whatever's happening in your life, you can go back to your heart, back to that connection with Jesus Christ, and nothing can take that away. So secondly, let's look at the promises in this psalm. It's great, I've got a to look at while I'm preaching. <laughs> Can you have like a, all different pictures? Yeah. Right, <laughs> and you, the people at the back can send you messages if you're going on too long. Hurry up, you've got <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Surely he will deliver you from the nature, from the nature, from the snare of the fowler and of the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. 
Notice the imagery here is like, like a young bird, maybe like an eagle in a nest. And I know we don't get eagles here, we get seagulls, don't we? Yeah? But we were in Fandidno a while back. We were in Fandidno. Get an ice cream. Got a little water on the front. Next thing, I've got, my, I've got my 99 here. There's a seagull right here having to go at it. I thought, he's not having And I went like that. And it flew away. And it was like that. It was after my flake. It's not like the best bit. It's not like that. I was a flake, 99. Not cheap, are they? And we, we, we walked back to the car and they were circling us and it was like the Alfred Hitchcock film, the birds. And they were, we, were sat in, we were sat in the car like, ah, like this without ice cream. We couldn't get them. We were, anyway, sorry, I digress. But anyway, the imagery is of a young bird like an eagle, perhaps being protected by the parent bird, yeah? He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. A fowler is someone who traps birds with snares, yeah? He will deliver you from that. And then, being covered with feathers is like being covered by the wings. The whole idea that we are given shelter and protection. His truth is your shield and buckler. The idea of shield in here is it all over protection, which comes from receiving God's truth in your life. It's like, you know, when you eat your ready room, I'm sure we ate a ready break after, and you've got like this thing all around you, you remember, and you're walking along. Well, you're not really on that, but on the advert, show me age. Sorry, shut up, don't Anyway, yeah, I'm not ready, pray. Don't need that anymore. Um, when knowledge drops from our head to our hearts, it becomes truth, doesn't it? What else? He promises protection from fear in verses 5 to 10. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and you'll see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor any plague come near your dwelling. What are we afraid of today, folks? What are we afraid of? Yeah, we don't really need to worry about nighttime raids and arrows and um, pestilence like locusts and things like that because we've got plenty of other things, haven't we, to cause us anxiety, a different array of things that cause us anxiety. You know, health issues, unemployment, debt, family problems. That's before you start thinking about global issues, isn't it? You know, like warm or globing, as they call it, global warming. Is that which way around does it go? I don't know, they make it up as they go along. Um, <laughs> Terrorism, pollution, earthquakes, tsunamis, threats of war, economic collapse. You know, that's, you know, you've got that, haven't you, as well? So, um, we've got plenty. Tell, I'll tell you now, you know what, if you haven't got Jesus, you've got a lot to worry about. There is an awful lot to worry about. But, you know, thank God for Jesus. They used to get a little sticker for you, can't you? Thank God for Jesus, remember those? But, you know, it's only through him that we haven't really got to worry too much. Because, um, I'll tell you something else. The Bible contains 365, 365 fear knots. That's one for every day. You can get a calendar with them all on it. You know, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. It's great, isn't it? Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. It says it quite clearly there, doesn't it? Be anxious for nothing. We need to put things in perspective. You know what? You've got a big problem. You've got an even bigger God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Even bigger. Amen. The biggest. If we stop to think about all potential threats to our well-being that exist, then we would all be living in fear. Yeah? But we don't live according to the world system. We live according to God's system, don't we? Yes. He has a high level, a different path different perspective, you know, God's ways are different, it says it in Isaiah, you know, my ways are higher, aren't they? My thoughts are higher, my ways are higher than yours, you know, he thinks a different way, and you know, so we get trapped into the way of thinking the way of the world, and we kind of thinking, hang on a minute, let's get back to thinking God's way, yeah. <coughs> things a bit differently, God's ways are different, we need to get back a different mindset sometimes. No wonder the psalmist writes, in Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Right. Yeah? Back to Psalm
Psalm 91, he promises strength in verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near you. It shall not give. That's quite, you know, that's quite important, isn't it, to remember where our strength comes from. And it, and it says elsewhere in the scriptures, our strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. Weakness. Not strength. It doesn't, you see what I mean about God's way has been differently. It doesn't make sense that strength can come from being weak. But you know, if you come to God and say, God, <coughs> I'm nothing. I'm so sorry. I've made a mess of things. You get on your knees before him. And you, uh, well, you know what? He's going to begin to give you strength and he's going to start building you up. And you're going to be stronger than you were before. Whatever is happening in your life, folks, I'm telling you it's true because it's been there. You know, I've been there. Probably didn't break the microphone. I forgot that was there. <laughs> but our strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, our strength comes from being weak. We give God our weaknesses, our imperfections. We give all that to him. Yeah? And he says, yeah, have some strength. Yeah? We don't operate in our own strength. We usually try to, and then we eventually realise it's no good. That's right. I'll tell you a little story. Years ago, quite a few years ago now, when the boys were quite small, we got to one of this, that stage where, you know what, we, we didn't, you didn't really have the support that you have now when you've got a young family with tax credits and all that kind of stuff. And we really were finding it quite hard. And we had quite a big mortgage and, and things were quite tough. And you know, it was like, it got to the stage where run out of money, too much month left at the end of the money, you know, any monthly pay, okay, no, too much month left at the end of the money. <laughs> one or two of you got that one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like that, and it's like, what are we going to do? And the credit card was maxed out, and it's like, what are we going to do? I've never really been in that situation where we're totally skinned, really. What on earth is going to happen? And you try and do things in your own strength, and you try and work things out, and you try, and in the end, you realise, you know what? One thing I haven't done is got on my knees and prayed and asked God to help me in this situation because I really don't know what to do now. So we left it to the last, last minute. The last, very, very last option, usually, is, you know what, God, I'm weak. I've got no strength. I've got no money. I don't know what I'm going to do. Please help. And, you know, in, in that moment, within hours, we doing that. There was a knock at the door and it was, it was a colleague and he was doing a favour for somebody and wiring some place up or something and he was desperately it was a deadline the next couple of days and he needed it finished. Will you come and help me? It wasn't exactly what I thought, you know, a nice wall of cash in the left box, there you go. <laughs> I had to go and earn it. But hey, God answered Amen. very quickly and delivered us out of that tough situation. Yeah. So we don't operate in our own strength. We try to and then eventually realise it's no good and then we get his strength when we come to our senses. But you know what, if you've got any strength or any success in your life, yeah, this is important, this, you need to realise it's because of God. Amen. If you're a smart businessman and you're doing really well, give God the glory. If you're a talented artist, give God the glory. If you're a fantastic trumpet player, give God the glory. I know you do. He is. You know. But um, whatever gift, whatever God's given you, whatever you do that's good, that you seem to excel in quite naturally, and there's a lot of talents and skills and things here, you know what? Give God the glory. Yeah. It's because of Him. Yeah. We need to remember that, don't we? Give Him the glory. What else have, What else we got? There's loads of stuff here, isn't there? He promises to give, give the help of angels in verses 11 and 12. For He shall give His angels charge over you, Keep you know, in all your ways. In their hands they'll bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah? In the New Testament when Jesus was being tempted. The devil was saying, God, you can do that. It says there. Don't tempt the Lord your God. But we live in the middle of a spiritual battle, don't we? And war rages all around us. Principalities and powers, angels and demons, spooky as it sounds. Yes, it is true. But he gives angels charge over you. Elsewhere, we're told that he has individually assigned angels to us. Yeah? My dad used to joke that, you know, the, the angels that protect us when we travel, if you go over 70 miles an hour on the motorway, they get off. <laughs> yeah? Now, I don't know about that. Grace, maybe. I don't know. 
So he has assigned angels to us. Believe that. That's a great promise. That's something to remember sometimes. Isn't it? You know, oh, God's looking. And how many times somebody, even people that aren't believers, say, wow, someone's looking after you. How they are. And thirdly, the seven I wills, verses 14 to 16. This last section, honestly now, thinking about politicians. And again, I'm not mentioning any names, any parties. It reads like a manifesto. You know, I will reduce taxes. I will improve the NHS. I will get rid of stamp duty. I will get rid of inheritance tax. I will, I will, I will. Sorry, I'm getting carried away, am I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he is known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. In this section, is God responding to the psalmist, to the, to the guy that's written the psalm. It's like a two-way dialogue. I can't even say it. It's like a two-way conversation. It's easy, isn't it? And um, the first part, the psalmist has been talking to God. And then the second part, God's answering back. It's a dialogue. It's exciting. So God speaks to us. Are we listening? Are we listening when God speaks to us? You know what? I mean, because we all want to hear from God, don't we? We would all probably say that we want to hear from God. When he speaks to us and we hear, it's dynamic and it's life changing and I'll tell you it blows your socks off. Yeah? When you realise, hang on a minute, God is speaking to me, he has spoken, here it is, wow. How amazing, how life changing that often is. When we really do encounter him, you will be the same again, but we need to listen. And you know what, some of you might be saying, oh, God never talks to me. Really? Have you ever looked at this? Uh, yeah. Talking all the time. Yeah. And I tell you, it's so easy now, it's so easy, you know, if, if you want to make sure that you don't forget to read your Bible every day, you just sign up to something like Bible Gateway, and every single day you're going to get an email off, them, yeah. and that email will contain your reading, and you'll get through the Bible in a year, mm. right? You just read your email, yeah, and then you delete it, and then the next day the note one comes in. After a year you've read your Bible, the whole of it. You know what I mean? Right. God speaks to us, doesn't he? Through his word. Are we listening? This is a thing. He speaks to us in lots of ways. Are we listening? Well, you know, this last week I've had an apprentice working with me. And I think sometimes we're like that. We're like this apprentice. You know, and I'm, he was supposed to be pushing the cable down a tube to me, to me to pull, right? And I was, I was up in it like a cherry big up in the air, 20 foot up in the air, waiting for this cable. I thought, what's this cable? So he's, he's like this. <laughs> Oh good. <laughs> so we had a few words and um, sorted it out. Anyway. But we're like that, aren't we? We've got some God's talking to us and we're distracted with something, aren't we? We're distracted with something trivial, something not that important really in the whole you know, God wants to talk to you, you know what, whatever whatever you're doing, put it down. Listen, because it's gonna be important. Yeah? So we need to listen. We want him to say this is the trouble now. We want God to say what we want to hear. That's one of the awkward things. So we've got to be kind of willing for God to say what he needs to say. Amen. Not yeah. what you want to hear. Because we filter it, don't we? We filter. The word of God comes. We filter up. Nah, nah, I can't possibly do that. That's too hard. You can't mean that. God wouldn't want me to do that. No chance. There you go. Nah, that was wrong. Next. Next word from God, please. Slightly better than that one. It doesn't work like that, does it? No. God speaks to us all the time. Sometimes it might not be want, what we want to hear, but is it of God? Does it match up with scriptures? God won't go against his revealed will. What he said in here, he won't contradict it. Other voices competing for our attention, our popular opinion. Just because a lot of people think something and believe something doesn't mean to say that it's right or it's godly. Yeah, human reasoning. We all know about God's will and purposes, and they transcend human reason because his ways and his thoughts are higher than ours, aren't they? Your own will, this is the, the toughest one, your own will, the flesh, comfort and convenience rule, don't they? Yeah? That's why if you look at a field, if you go out 
running or walking anywhere, the, um, you, won't, you won't go like that. There'll be a well-worn path across, the shortest possible route across that field. No, I don't. Because we don't like to go around corners, we like to go in a straight line. Shortest distance, easiest way. But it's not necessarily that way with God. God might not want you to do the shortest distance or the easiest way. He might have something else. So there's your own will, the flesh. There's also the still small voice, isn't there? And in 1 Kings 19, 11 and 12, it, it says this. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. And the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, was a fire. And the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. So you have to listen. You have to listen. We need to tune in to his frequency. His ways are higher. His thoughts are different. Recognize his voice. It's a different way of death. Back to Psalm 91, just wrapping things up. This is the last section where God replies and makes some promises. I will deliver him. You know, all people have times when they need God's help, as I said before. You know what I mean? And it's better to get yourself into that position sooner and wait till it's the last resort. I will deliver him. I will set him on high, verse 14. Maybe this means he will help him rise above his problems. We're, when we're in Christ, we're raised into new life, raised out of our sins, and raised into eternal life, given a different perspective. He will call upon me and I will answer him. The promise of the privilege of prayer, God answers when we call on him. We need to be connected to the vine, don't we? And I will be with him in trouble, verse 15. There are probably a lot of troubles in this building today. We've all got our individual problems and our issues that we're dealing with. Some probably worse than others. Some we don't know, you know, the answer to perhaps. God doesn't promise a life free from troubles, does he? He doesn't say that, you know, when you come to God, all your problems are going to disappear. They might not. They probably won't. You know, and it actually says in the Bible that many of the afflictions of the righteous, but then it goes on to say, I will deliver them. About them all, but there's this period where you, you know where you will have those issues. But God does promise to be with us through them. And then it says, verse 15, I will deliver him and honor him. Moses honored God, and God honored him. Moses refused the treasures of Egypt, and, and God gave him treasures in heaven. Moses gave up a family in Egypt and God gave him a nation. He gave him he gave up fame and power, and God gave him fame and honor. And then it says, with a long life, I will satisfy him. Satisfaction can't be bought with money, can it? God will satisfy you with a long life. It will last forever, eternal. And then, and then finally, verse 16, I'm showing my salvation. So we get a long life now, but heaven later. Amen. Amen. So um, I hope that's put a different perspective on the events of the last week or two. And, you know, we need to turn our eyes and our thoughts to, to God's promises, not man's promises. Amen. 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 Oh, God bless you.